Okay, so I'm Simon Thompson. I'm head of data science for GFT Technologies in the UK. We're a financial technology specialist consultancy, about 10,000 people, and we work in all the big investment banks. Um, and I lead the machine learning practice there. Uh, and I like my coffee black and strong. Small talk, small talk, small talk. We are so awful <laughs> at it. Uh, yeah, we get right <laughs> to the big talk, don't we? This is not a conversation of small talk, this one. I mean, Abby, it's great to have you here. You are a new first-timer first co-host, and so it's probably only right if we let people know who you are, what you're doing here with us today. Hey, everyone. I'm Abby. I am machine learning engineer. And I'm also helping out with the podcast at MLOps Community. It's fantastic to be able to talk to everybody. Uh, prior to this, I was a machine learning researcher. I was at UCLA and a couple of other things. <laughs> so I've been in the field for sort of, I don't know, about six, seven years. Amazing. And today we talked with Simon Thompson, who just came out with a new book. We talk all about that. And so much more. I mean, we got into just like, <laughs> you can tell that he's been in machine learning and especially like machine learning in the industry for a long time because his thought process was so clear on the question that you asked him about what do you recommend when you're starting a team and how do you build out the team? Do you get data engineers? Do you get data scientists? And he said, no, 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 First figure out how much money the project is going to make and then figure out the rest, which I felt like was, this is like the voice of reason, it's wisdom, experience all bundled into one. I loved it because that's that's usually something which is missing in the community. There are, there are people talking about things from an engineering perspective. And yes, there are people who say, oh, we should talk about business problems and as such, but it goes more so towards understanding the customer, understanding the scope of the problem instead of just understanding how much finances the financing is is this project going to require and not just that but how much money are we going to make out of mm -hmm. this project yeah and how all of that will then dictate the size of the team you need the type of team you need is it going to be are we thinking that we need something that is going to be highly available online then we're going to look at it like this but that highly available online thing, it needs to be very tied to business objectives and the ability to make money. So that was one huge one. It always stands out to me when we get guests on here that are very focused on that because yeah. it shows that they understand. They've seen it too many times, I think, where a project will get started, but then it kind of peters out. And they've probably heard too many times that cliche quote of like, oh, 80% of models never make it into production. And so they don't want that to happen. Uh, he also, it was really cool when we got into the idea of how it differs between researchers and industry on the motivations that each one has. So many I things loved that... On, on the talk was also the part where he was sort of talking about the differences between the healthcare industry versus the finance industry mm. and how much does the accuracy matter? What are the things that one should be looking for? Because that's not often talked about. Everybody sort of just gives up one example and says, oh, trust is really important. But when it comes to somebody, there's far too many industries and there's no one dictates one rule that dictates sort of every single industry. So while, yes, that's important, but then there are so many other industries where the focus is different. So a little background on Simon before we jump into this conversation. He's been doing machine learning since 1994. <laughs> He's collaborated on all kinds of different projects in the EU, in the UK, with the government, UK government. Uh, funded research projects. And right now, as you mentioned, he is working at a technology consultancy company called GFT, and it mainly works within the capital markets in the financial sector. Let's get into this full conversation. And if you are not subscribed to the 
email newsletter that we send out. We've got three different email newsletters. Go jump on it. We'll leave a link to that in the description in case you want to join us and hear more from the MLOps community. Also joining the Slack. Also One join the time. Slack. Also join the, well, the Slack gets a ton of people in it every day. So maybe not, <laughs> we don't need anybody <laughs> to join the Slack, but if you want to give us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast, that would be super helpful for us too. Reviews and stars and all the best. So thanks everyone for listening. Let's jump into this conversation. Simon, good to have you here, man. Nice, nice to come. Nice to be here. I know it's been a long time coming. I know that I, I reached out to you like probably like six months ago when I mm -hmm. saw the book that you are writing or have written uh, was coming out. And so wanted to get something in the books. It's yeah. written. It's, it's out. It's written and it's all, it's available. It's in the early access program right now. So awesome. we're, we're, um, it should be printed before the end of this year. But you can get it electronically because getting things printed takes a while. And so we're going to talk all about that. And we are going to get much more into the book. But we should probably start at the beginning. And you have one of the coolest things that you can say on your bio that I have seen in a long time. And that is you've been doing machine learning since 1994 uh, when I... Let's see. I was like seven years old in 1994. <laughs> I was and... born in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was uh, twenty something, and I won't say exactly how many twenties because it's embarrassing. I'm um, by no means calling you old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have to face facts. It's just it's just life is how it is. It happens to you, and then you think, wow. But yeah, that's when I started my PhD was uh, January 1994. And I had actually done some machine learning before that. I did some machine learning, probably started 18 months before that. And I did a wildly ambitious undergrad project, uh, which was um, to try to learn prologue clauses using a thing called genetic programming and search uh, that was popular then, which didn't work because obviously... It's probably still beyond the state of the art, but I was a kid and I thought, oh, I know, I know what would be cool if we could, if we could solve some problems by just specifying them and then learning the solution. I mean, talk to us about growing up and how you had this inclination towards computers and engineering and all of that. Um, not so much towards towards engineering, more I was more interested in art actually when I was younger and maths. I was always very interested in maths. But then what happened was I was very lucky, very, very lucky. My dad went on a course at work and on the course they had a computer and they had a Sinclair ZX81 and they showed all the people on the course, you know, what computers can do because it was kind of like, you know, this is going to be the future in, in those days. Uh, and it tells you, you know, when people come on the telly and they say, this is the future, you should listen, because <laughs> it was. And uh, he came he came home and he said, we've, we've got to get a computer. And um, that then we did. And uh, and of course, it was just so interesting because we did not have Netflix then. And it was so interesting to have a ZX81 and to be able to write programs on it and uh, it did things you could make it do things and that was that was the thing that really fascinated me what was the first thing you actually wrote on that computer was it like writing a kernel <laughs> because i know a lot of computer no. engineers start out working it had, ba it had basic so it had it, it had a, a basic interpreter what were its features? So it had 1K of memory when it came, one kilobyte. And then for my Christmas present, I got uh, a RAM pack, which you stuck on the back of it, and it expanded it to 16K. And 16K, you could do a lot in 16K. Wow. That's massive. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. And it, and it had, but it had a basic interpreter. So you, you could program it with uh, bytecode. Um, and I did a bit, but not very much because... Programming in bytecode is incredibly tedious and error prone. It's really painful, as anybody who's done it will tell you. The thing I wrote, first of all, the first thing was Hello World, you know, obviously just 
and then put a loop around it. So Hello World, go to 10, and it fills the screen with, with, with Hello World, and that was amazing. And then started to write some games, and it was really, it was a social thing to try and make friends. And what was the plan? So you did your bachelor's, uh, yeah. then going to master's, PhD, and everything. Were no, you planning to... No, I went to... straight to PhD. Uh, I was very lucky. and Well, I was lucky and unlucky. I got accepted into a master's program, which was master's and PhD. And then they um, they had a funding crisis, and they <laughs> unaccepted me. And I was uh, I was quite miffed. And I spent some time looking for a new a new gig. Uh, and I tried out for a, a bunch of jobs and I got a I got a job. But before I could start, I got accepted onto a PhD program. Um, and it was basically I, I just I think I went to the interview and um, I wasn't that uh, frightened about it. It wasn't so important because I already had another job. I was going to go off and be a software engineer down the road. And um, uh, I just thought I'd go along and see if it was interesting. So then... You've obviously seen a lot of changes, especially in the machine learning field. Is there anything that jumps out at you when it comes to unexpected changes? Everything, everything is unexpected to me. Uh, maybe I'm just um, like a, a, a Taoist or something, just constantly surprised by every innovation and it's because it's because everything's so out of scale now you know the 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 idea of 200 billion parameter models is it just doesn't make any sense at all and it it's just meaningless words to me and i can't i can't imagine what that really is like although i use them and and just the resources that are put into creating models is extraordinary you know the the thousands of gpus to create a model it's just bizarre unimaginable to to uh somebody from my era i think um yeah but so computationally you've seen a lot as in how computers have sort of grown in terms of memory in terms of computability and everything just mm -hmm. the ram as well how have things changed on an infrastructure level according to you when it comes to ai well i, I mean you know i when i did my phd i wrote use that and compile it on my machine and uh, you know that 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 uh, maybe that gives you a flavor of how different things were you know it was but maybe, maybe probably at the cutting edge. I mean, if you're doing a PhD in machine learning now, I guess that you probably are still coding away in in uh, CUDA, right? Uh, probably you you you're having to wrangle really unpleasant problems to do with GPUs not talking to each other or something. I, I stay away from that now as much as I can. Um, uh, I, I suppose I suppose what's happened is it's scaled, right? That we 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 had almost impossible infrastructure problems which were at the level of putting together five workstations over an ethernet network and uh, making them exchange messages to do distributed computation and now people have got these indescribable problems of putting together you know 500 gpus over a data center and to make them work together to create a a trillion a trillion parameter scale model or something uh, how have things changed in terms of open source? Because right now, if you're looking at the field, we have so many open source libraries and so many, so many communities sort of working together, solving the bigger picture problems. Were things a little bit more distributed back in the day? And was it sort of obvious that there will be such massive communities and companies contributing to open source programs when it comes to pushing the field forward? Well, I mean, Ross, Ross Quinlan, um, I mean, it wasn't open source. He sold his book with a, a disc in it, right? But I mean, I wrote to him a few times and, and he obviously didn't care what I did with his code, really. I think so long as I didn't make a million dollars out of it. But I'm, I wrote to him and said, oh, I'm using it in my PhD. And he was like, yeah, great, you know, just go for it. Um, as I remember it, he'd probably now sue me. But I think he's still, I don't know if he's still alive, actually. But I benefited from that availability. Um and I suppose I was on the, at the beginning of that movement that that uh, people were, you know, in those days there was GNU um, and um, Richard Stallman had started doing things and people were 
quite open. I th I think that probably I was very lucky that people were extremely accessible. That that whenever I asked somebody a dumb question, uh, they had time for me, and they would you know people were really surprised that that I was interested. That there was somebody else working on what they were doing, and they wanted to help. And and people were really generous to me with their time, and openness, and 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 helping me solve problems. Hmm. Uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to to get anywhere without that from a community but it was probably more informal and probably less stress than nowadays because I think that the problem now is people do something in open source and either nobody uses it or people expect it to have a commercial level of support and yeah. I, I ran an open source community for years and years and uh, towards the end of it it got distressingly difficult helping people dealing with the requests because the expectations just went through the roof of what what people should be able to get from you yeah and and um, sometimes I, I I do sympathize with a few of the different poor behaviors you see um because I think somehow people end up depending on a piece of open source software and then they're under tremendous pressure because of that, and 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 it's awful for them. And I, I really empathise with that. And I, the other one is um, just the uh, difficulty of of maintaining a, a, a thread with an open source maintainer to resolve something really to the end, which I think is extremely frustrating. Where, you know. Sometimes you report a problem, you reproduce it, you show the code or whatever, but then you get pulled away to do something else. So let's change gears a little bit here. Uh, you mentioned before that choosing and running the algorithms when it comes to machine learning is only yeah. a small piece of it. And I think that's very yes. clear. And it is something that we see over and over again with that um machine learning, the high interest credit card debt of machine yeah. learning paper when that came out and it showed the different yeah. boxes and how the models are just a little sliver of that. And then you have all yeah. of the infrastructure around it. And you also mentioned like setting up and organizing the project, which yes. doesn't really get put into that infrastructure piece that came out of that Google paper. What exactly did you mean by setting up these projects? Well, um, obviously, you've got to get the right team for your project, and that's a big issue. Uh, almost nothing anymore gets done by one person. It's it's pretty unusual, in my experience at the minute anyway. You, and, and it's too dangerous in a commercial context, right? You can't really have... If somebody's got one person working on something, it's you're pretty well doomed because people have holidays you know get ill uh get a new job right and and you're just not gonna deliver uh so you you've got to have a team it's a group of people working together it's got to be the right team um so finding them is a priority i think breaking down the project understanding what it's for uh i had a good lesson today a, a collaborator was taking a team that I'm managing right now uh, and they and we hadn't got to that even though I have obviously worked very hard to get this project all set up There's, that was something that we hadn't got to at that point and I think being able to get under the skin of the project and really have a shared understanding of everybody about what it's about and what we're doing here and why is really crucial I think getting at the data is a hell of an important thing. Um, and you know nothing about an ML project until you've seen the data, nothing at all. And, um, you know, you're not going to get it very easily, uh, you know, and, and even when you do get technical access to the data, actually it's a big process to get into it and to understand it and delve into it properly. And again, you know, today I was in a meeting, I was talking about um, why it was that I didn't think that we could really say we had sign-off about the data, the, the, the data fields we were using in a modeling project, because the reality is that 
when the models are done, we we may well make a whole load of discoveries about um, the the data fields we're working with that we can say, okay, you know, this looks like the right set of data fields. Um, so I think things like that, and I think also agreeing a way of working with your team, so creating a culture in the project is something that people miss out, and that's a hard process. Um, but you have to get to a set of behaviors, a set of expectations, a set of agreed outcomes, uh, agreed ways of taking on bits of work. And a lot of it's standard. You know, we'll pick up a ticket from the the, the ticketing system, whatever you use. Um, God forbid Jira, but, you know, maybe, maybe it's Jira. Um, and you pick up a ticket and you have to sign it off. Uh, and, you know, what does the documentation look like? What does it mean? Have you done a code review? What does a code review mean in this project? What are our expectations during a code review? Um, when you say you've you've done some testing, what does that mean? You know, what are our expectations around using the test data? Because you can consume it and and then it's no good because we've we, we've optimized everything on the test data. You know, we've we've overused it. Um, so you have to figure that all out. And it's different from project to project because the projects themselves are different, right? Um, so that's setting up a, mod, uh, a project, I think, yeah. So let's say there's a hypothetical organization that is just starting out to build their data science team. How do you think they should go by it? Which is how many people should they start out with? Is that a decision you make ideally after you've already looked into the data? Which is what kind of skill set do you actually require before you start thinking about all of those things? I think you need to think about how much money you're going to make first, right? So. I think I think that there's so many data science projects start off with a uh, a challenge that isn't really connected to the nuts and bolts of the business, and it's always going to be disastrous for everybody concerned because, okay, your sponsor has a certain amount of rope that they've got because the CEO loves them and they've been so successful and they're doing all these other things, but your sponsor is going to move on at some point, but that. That has to be the, the you have to you have to get to that answer. Where is it that the 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 target is? What are we gonna do? And and then that will tell you how many people, what kind of people, because you know, if it's gonna be a, a massive fishing expedition through a vast amount of data, we need data engineers, right? We 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 don't need too many of those data scientists, maybe we'll need one or two. We won't, won't need too many of them. Will we need many machine learning engineers? Well, maybe not at first, right? But then again, it can be the opposite way. It can be that we know that there's, you know, we're going to be producing 2,000 models here. There's there's um, well-known models that people, you know, we've had the consultants in, they've built some things before. We can see that there's 2,000 models we need to get rid of our regulation risk or whatever, Okay, you're going to need a lot of machine learning engineers because you're going to have a massive production bottleneck. So it, it's it's that's what drives it, definitely. The business drives it. Uh, you've seen a lot of data science teams in industry as well as academia. What are the big challenges that are faced when it comes to the management side in both of those teams? And what's the core difference? Um, is definitely motivation, I would say. Um, uh, I think in academia, um, I think that people are very self-starting and their motivation is very intrinsic. Um, and I think that in industry, as much more extrinsic motivation in the team. The team are looking to expand their skills. They're looking to get personal growth. I think that's one of the most key things that I see in teams. People want to go into a team where they're going to have personal growth. And, and if they feel like, oh, I've not got personal growth, they will leave. And, and they'll go to the next place that gives them personal growth. And you have to accept that. So thinking about the data teams and, and the skills that you need to develop along the way and that growth that you're talking about, how do you recommend people go about not only growing in the way that you're saying uh, or finding teams where they have that ability to grow, but also what you said beforehand and making sure that the data scientist or the machine learning engineer 
understands the fundamental value of how to get to the money and how to prove out their use case and prove out the benefits and the ROI of the use case. So on the on the second bit, uh, I think that it's a long process. It takes it takes quite a lot of work for for people in teams to be able to understand for a particular business where the real value is going to be, because you have to really get under the skin of it. And it's sometimes uh, sometimes I find people don't really want to do that work. Um, we'll look after that. So people have got to be open and inquisitive, right? And and inquisitive over a long period of time, humble about what the the SMEs are telling you. You know why is it that they don't think it will work? And you should try and find the thing that they think, hmm, yeah, maybe that one will work, right? Because you know often then there, there's something they can't articulate, which which is the blocker, right? That the the data is bullshit in a in a in a deep and, and particular way that can't really be articulated. But when you get to that understanding of why the model isn't working, suddenly they'll pop up and they'll articulate it perfectly and say, I told you this at the beginning of the project, right? And you know, they've been looking for that articulation for three months. But they, you know, it's really hard for them to do it until it's put on the screen, and they say, "That's what I said," you know, or "That's what we were trying to tell you." So, yeah, I think I think that in, inquisitive nature and and curiosity about the business you're working with to try to pin down what is really going on, what matters to the people who are going to be using your model, and I think that's really important. You know, it's something that's coming out more and more in the wider world of machine learning, I think, obviously, which is is the people who are using your model, the people who are going to be impacted by your model are the most important people in the mix. And that's because your model might chew them up or it might make them miserable. Um, And, you know, there are two ways to be very unethical. You can be very unethical by knowing that you're going to chew people up with your model and not caring and then just building it and say, I don't care, I got paid. That's pretty bad, right? But what often people don't understand is that not being curious about the people that you're doing this to and not inviting them into the process, I think is equally equally unethical, right? I love that you point out the conversation towards ethics because then it brings to the entire thing about monitoring deployment and thinking skill thinking or building a product with scalability in mind where when a data science team is starting out how does it really balance between shipping versus scalability which is addressing that there's a big demographic that we're dealing with and not leaving anyone out I think I think there are two things that are conflated there, right? So, well, Abby, maybe you maybe you push back in a second and tell me I'm wrong, but I, I'm thinking there's a bit of a conflation because there's the thing about monitoring and governability and management for your models and and the the system you've integrated the models into, and then there's the scalability, right? And I I think that the scalability uh, brings a whole bag of issues with it that people love to deal with and to focus on and to talk about and then they never get used right (laughs) because um your model is just you know it never gets hit with the imaginary requirement that you've got i mean obviously if you know your model is going to get run 10,000 times a day, you must make a model that can be run 10,000 times a day and it must not cost $50 to run each time because if it does, you're going to go bust. You can't have that. You can't spend half a million pounds a day on 10,000 customers. Forget it, right? That that That's ridiculous. So obviously you have to, to think things through like that. But I would say deal with those requirements in the moment. And then when when you have the first world problem where people come to you and say it's not scalable, well, then you can spend the money then to try and make the thing more scalable, right? But then on the other side is the the manageability and the governability and and the usability of the model, the transparency of it, the explainability. And if you don't put those things in, it's useless, right? I mean, you might you might have it in production, you might be running it, 
uh, all that you're doing is building up a huge a huge debt for the future and that debt can and we've seen it it comes due very suddenly and very nastily you know people arrive at the door and say you have committed an offence and you know we want we want reparations now that thing has to be turned off right and there's a huge amount of 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 damage as a result and that that's no good right so I, I always think you, you've got to have those levers which allow you to manage the thing in production and to be able to show people not only how it works, but why it works in that way. What were the decisions that went into making it work that way? I think that's fair. That's fair. So, I always so remember I'm- Twitter, right? So there's the Twitter's probably the most scaled thing in the world. But when I think it was a guy called Blaine Cook was the first sysadmin at at Twitter, the first developer, and he built it all on MySQL, right? So it was just a MySQL database for quite a long time. And I think it wasn't until quite a long way into 2009 that they really had to rip it all out and and build much more specialist infrastructure uh, to deal with the traffic they got. Um, And that... That didn't kill Twitter. <laughs> Definitely not. And it reminds me of what we were talking about before with Uber and how Uber was built by a dev shop in Mexico. And the story goes, I don't know, I've never looked into the Uber code base, but I've heard that you can find some comments in Spanish still. And so it, I really like that idea of you want to be pragmatic about the traffic that you're actually going to get and how much do you need to keep that scaling question in mind and keep that ability to scale in mind and how much of a priority it is. Because it reminds me of a friend of mine who talked about how at every conference, basically in any talk, you're always going to hear someone ask, yeah, but how does it scale? That's like the go-to question that you'll hear in the conferences. And so sometimes that is a very valid question, but a lot of times it's just the the cop-out question that uh, every engineer is going to ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And, and, you know, you may never need it. Um, Let's let's just be open to that idea. Um, I think it's it's a powerful idea. But when it comes to accountability and manageability and governability you are going to need it if it's going to production it has to be manageable Mm. you can't inflict unmanaged unmonitored software on anyone so let's uh let's go into that a little bit are there certain things that you feel like with machine learning there's the must-haves and then there's the nice-to-haves. Yelf. Uh, so fancy algorithms are definitely the nice-to-haves, right? So um, that last N percent of accuracy is a nice-to-have often. Uh, you know, your business. sometimes there are business drivers that are different from that, right? So obviously, if you... If you if your 0.1% of accuracy equals $50 million a year, right, then you are going to spend a lot of money on that 0.1% of accuracy, right? That, that, that's for sure. Often, though, that's illusory. It, it's, not, it's not actually true. It's not going to matter. Um, there's a certain level of performance which is going to be uh, successful for you. If, if it's low-hanging fruit and you can just you know, pull it way past that 99% or something, terrific. But often people people optimize for uh, quote unquote accuracy uh, and do far too much on that. And it's uh, and I, I think I think that it it's it's just a symptom of not really understanding how to how to evaluate your product in the context of the business that you're delivering it to. And I think that's the need to have, which is the deep understanding of how this should be evaluated and what is valuable and what is not valuable about this product and that's often a thing that just gets left left behind and people are saying oh it's f1 it's got a great f1 score right and and sometimes it can have a great f1 score that's been a miracle of technology and it's just not good enough to use 
right? And it was never going to be good enough to use because, you know, as soon as you figure that out, you realize there is no model in the world that's going to get me to that level of performance. You know, we need 90, you know, I mean, the, the medical case is a, a, a big one. You know, there are lots of, of cases in medicine where you've got to be almost absolutely flawless to 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 dare to employ this thing in 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 the field because you will kill people right and after 10 minutes of looking at the problem you realize yeah i could do a really good model on this but it will not be almost flawless right it's not going to be as good as the consultant it'll be good uh, i could probably get a conference paper out of it but uh, you know, I am not. I am not going to participate in a project where somebody is going to pick it up and try and use it on on patients. Right? No way. And I think I think a lot of time that that's the big thing that we we need to do more on in our work. I think healthcare is often one of the most quoted scenarios that we discuss, especially when it comes to accuracy or talking about yeah. the trustability of the models. How does it change when it comes to different markets? So for example, you're working in capital markets. Where the yeah. challenges are, do the same challenges transfer in other domains as well and equally as much? Uh, I, I think it's very different. I mean, the, the classic one is uh, people thinking uh, that a model that predicts price brilliantly is going to be really useful, right? When actually what you want is a model that tells you when to buy or sell, right? <laughs> because you, 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 and and, I, and in fact, I guess that's somewhat the same for, for medicine, right? You don't, people often say, oh, I want something that's really good at diagnostics, right? And, and it's really good at saying when somebody's got cancer or not, right? The reality is whenever I've talked to, oncologists they they said to me uh almost every day i i see people walking through my office door and i know what's wrong with them before they sat down you know i can just see it and and certainly you know five minutes into the conversation they're pointing at where it hurts i know i know what's wrong at that point you know and and after that everything is just in the in the, the margins of them checking and making sure and 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 not malpracticing by assuming something but they they're good at diagnostics what they want is something that tells them how to treat the patient what what the what the course of treatment should be i mean that seems to be the consensus i hear same in in, in finance you know it's it's very often not you know the traders are like well we know what price roughly what prices is going to close out but should we sell it you know what will it be doing tomorrow what's you know is it a good idea to sell it now that those are the kind of questions i think i think the other one is um you know the cost of of its misbehaviour. So, if we're doing models that are, are looking to see is somebody misbehaving, uh, you know, some sort of surveillance thing. Well, if we say that trader's doing something a bit suspicious, and it's not true, it's okay, right? They get checked out. Somebody reviews the case. They say no, it's normal. It's normal behaviour. Stupid model, and it. It, you know, it's irritating and we'd rather that it didn't produce that false positive, but it's not a big deal. If we miss the guy who's really doing bad things, that is a big deal. So we can't do that. And, you know, especially if it's obvious, right? We can't we can't have a model that just doesn't check the particular field that it should be checking because, oh, when we did the F1 score, you know, that didn't matter, right? It's got to be, it's got to be, accountable we've got to be able to say no it did check everything and so you know the, those those are the differences i think yeah the both are highly regulated industries right and so it makes sense that there is some crossover but then there's also a little bit of nuance there i want to change gears and jump into your book a little bit because I know that we were talking about it beforehand and we're going to tell everyone what we're going to do, but the fine details are not quite ironed out because I just proposed this to Simon beforehand. I said, we'll give out some of his books. We don't know how many books we're going to give out yet. The first people to comment, we're going to be giving you free books and we uh, want to get these out there. For those who do not know, the book is called Managing Machine Learning Projects from Design to Deployment. Let's jump into this. What was the inspiration behind it? Um, so 
what happened was that I did a year uh, as a visiting fellow at somewhere called the Turing Centre in London, the Turing Institute. And it was when it was starting up uh, and I got to talk to an awful lot of people I wouldn't otherwise have talked to about what they were doing with machine learning projects uh, in a bunch of different contexts and industries, you know, people from engineering, civil engineering and um, uh, dot coms and uh, defense and intelligence, all sorts of interesting people were doing stuff. And I realized that the, that some people had access to a community of practice or have had access to a community of practice for a long time. And there are some places like the big, the big uh, tech companies, right? That, you know, there's a huge community of practice and there are people in those companies who have spent many years figuring out all of these wrinkles and issues and talking about it to everybody in their community. There are a lot of other people who uh, aren't, are excluded from those communities of practice who, who have not ever been in that community of practice and never will be able to get into that community of practice because that's not what they do. And... Um, uh, I felt really bad for them because talking to them, there were a whole load of stuff, they, things they were doing, which were just uh, fatal, right? Just just blunders and, um, you know, the kind of things we've been talking about, like, like not understanding really the problem and thinking that, you know, certain things would be easy to solve when they wouldn't be easy to solve or not having any infrastructure to support their project or not having a team or having a weird construct of a team I could sit here and be smug about it and, and say you know I'm a uh, I know how to do it and um, why don't you come pay me some money uh, but it seems a bit churlish and so I thought well what what would be appropriate and I thought well try and write down uh, what it is you think would help people and that's where the idea for the book came from was just to say um, you know, I've I've been in a community of practice for a long time. I was very lucky about having the people I had around me. Uh, I had a lot of good experiences where people helped me and told me things um, at, at all sorts of amazing institutions. And um, uh, it, you should write it down and, and put it there for people to talk about. What are some of the cool conversations that you expect to come out of the book? I think just people saying, oh, that's not how we do it. We we do it a different way. Or why did you think that's the right way of doing it? That's not the right way of doing it. You should do it a different way. Um, hmm. So that's I, those those are the cool the cool kind of conversations I'd want. I mean, the point the point is to to try to have that so that we do get the good practice out there that we have. You know, I would like there to be a widely agreed, accessible uh point of good practice for ML ML people that they could actually say this is this is the these are the right sort of things to do. And I think we're getting to the time now when when it's starting to be possible to have that because you know there is there is this this available technology now. That's such a great point. This is the time that it feels like more information is out there. There's more maturity. There are communities that have sprung up and the good practices should be codified and should at least be out there for the masses. Well, Simon, uh, we're going to cut it here for everyone listening. If you want one of his books, if you want the downloadable yeah. version comment and we will send you one over maybe <laughs> if you're lucky that's yeah. it for now there will if, be free books there I will be it, how <laughs> many i can't say for sure <laughs> exactly so but if anyone wants in the to meantime, if you are already listening to this conversation there is a beat program with manning mm. which allows all of the chapters to be available to everybody online yeah. so it's a fantastic idea to just look in and no, for sure. Hey, I want the book because like that's something I do a lot of times, which is I'll read the yeah. book a few chapters and then I'll buy the book because I feel like it is so important to be able to reference back to yeah. the book, essentially. Uh, and the whole the whole book is available now. And the point I think the point of having a book is to have, uh, you know, everything brought together to try and bring things together rather than have just one article about one thing, but to try to bring things together. So, um 
you know, I think I think the fact that uh, as of last week, chapter ten got into the Meep, uh, and um, you know, it's all there for people to to have a look at. It's awesome to see. So thanks so much, Simon. It's if anyone pleasure. wants Thank to reach out to much. you, what's the best way to connect? Email simon g simon two thompson at gmail dot com. Yeah, that's number two. So it's not a hard one, is it? Nice. And it's Thompson with a P. Uh, or on Twitter, I am AI Simon Thompson. You should be able to find me. Send me messages and I'll I'll reply because uh, it is fun. Uh, about it. the book, not about my hairstyle or something yeah. like that. Right? <laughs> Excellent, man.